American Experience is made possible by the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation to enhance public understanding of the role of technology. The foundation also seeks to portray the lives of the men and women engaged in scientific and technological pursuit. At Liberty Mutual Insurance, we do everything we can to help prevent accidents and make America a safer place. Liberty Mutual is proud to support American Experience. How do you get a weed-free lawn? A healthy garden. A home that's pest-free. Every day we work to find new and better solutions. Ortho. Proud to support the American Experience on PBS. American Experience is also made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. And contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. United States votes $400 million to help that war, we're not voting for a giveaway program. We're voting for the cheapest way that we can prevent the occurrence of something that would be of the most terrible significance to the United States of America, our security. If we withdrew from Vietnam, the communists would control Vietnam. Pretty soon, Thailand, Cambodia, Laos, Malaya would go. If this little nation goes down the drain and can't maintain her independence, ask yourself what's going to happen to all the other little nations. If the United States now were to throw in the towel and come home, and the communists took over South Vietnam, then all over Southeast Asia, all over the Pacific, in the Mideast, in Europe, in the world, the United States would suffer a blow and peace, because we are the great peacekeeping nation in the world today because of our power, would suffer a blow from which it might not recover. First a handful of advisors, then the Marines. Finally, an army of half a million. That was the Vietnam War. It was an undeclared war. A war without front lines or clear objectives. A war against an elusive enemy. A war. Steve, what you speak to me. Yeah, yeah, I'm still alive. Speak to me. Huh? What's your name? Tell me what your name is. Where are you from? Steve, Seattle, Washington. Seattle, is a good town. Good town, good town. I Very good. Go to sleep, huh? Huh? I go to sleep? No, don't go to sleep. We had some precarious situations and we lost some people, but we always won. So to me, uh, we were very successful, you know, but as I think of it now, I don't know what we won. We won a, a box on a, on a map where the next day we left it and we never came back, maybe. It was a war that blurred the line between friend and enemy. Wherever the Americans went, they burned and destroyed and killed. I didn't see any guerrillas being killed, only villagers. An eight-year-old or a nine-year-old can kill you just as quick as a 25 or a 26-year-old man. Back here in the States, the kids are playing cowboys and Indians. Over there, they've been playing it for real. It was a war with deep roots, deeper than most Americans knew. Ho Chi Minh and his followers fought for decades against the French, then against the Americans and their South Vietnamese ally. I always believed in my country. 
But instead of sending my sons out to defend their country, I sent them out to die. It was a war that turned South Vietnam inside out. A war that changed the GIs who fought it. GI, you want Vietnamese cigarette? For a box of Tide, you could get a carton of pre-packed, pre-rolled marijuana cigarettes soaked in opium. For $10, you could get a vial of pure heroin. You could get liquid opium, speed, acid, anything you wanted. It was the first television war. What's he got, small arms? Small arms, automatic fire, grenade launcher, and grenade. With uncensored battle reports flashed to the folks at home. What's the hardest part of it? Not knowing where they are, that's the worst thing. You lost any friends? Quite a few. We lost one the other day. The whole thing stink, really. It was the first war Americans opposed in huge numbers, openly and passionately. The Vietnam War ended when the communists took Saigon. The end of the war left questions and issues that are still unanswered and unresolved. Well, it's time that we recognized ours was in truth a noble cause. Let us tell those who fought in that war that we will never again ask young men to fight and possibly die in a war our government is afraid to let them win. Vietnam, a noble cause, a shameful venture. This television series looks back on a hard chapter in America's history. Two and a half million Americans fought in Vietnam. And 58,000 Americans died there. Why? Vietnam lasted 15 years, but the Vietnamese have known war a long time, more than 2,000 years. Their traditional enemy was China, their giant neighbor to the north. For centuries, Vietnam was the southernmost part of China's empire. The Vietnamese absorbed Chinese culture and customs, but they never accepted Chinese rule. Today, throughout Vietnam, they commemorate the Trung sisters, who led a rebellion against China in the first century after Christ. The rebellion failed, but the Trung sisters are still heroines, part of a long line of Vietnamese who fought foreign domination. Our history, from the time of the Hung Kings and the Trung Sisters to the era of President Ho Chi Minh, 
has been a history of great struggle. Throughout history, the Vietnamese people have always done their best to defend the country and to build the nation. They fought for almost a thousand years after the Trungs to evict the Chinese. Then they pushed south to their present borders, conquering other peoples in their path. The country expanded so rapidly that it fragmented in a series of civil wars. Despite their internal conflicts, the Vietnamese regarded themselves as one country and one people. But they were too weak and divided to fight off the conquering Europeans in the 19th century. Around 1860, the French seized the area near Saigon. They took over central and northern Vietnam during the next two decades. And by 1885, Vietnam had once again lost its independence. French Indochina at the end of the 1880s. Laos. Cambodia, and Vietnam, which the French divided into three regions, Cochin China, Annam, and Tonkin. To the Vietnamese, the division was a deliberate attempt to destroy their national unity. The Vietnamese resisted, the French called all resistors pirates, and they sent in the troops for the first pacification of Vietnam. They staged public executions, the severed heads were photographed and printed on postcards which soldiers sent home to sweethearts in Paris with kisses from Hanoi. It took 20 years to get the Vietnamese resistance under control. Then the French could concentrate on the economics of colonialism, trying to transform Vietnam into a source of profit. <laughs> The people here suffered a lot because of high taxes and hard forced labor. They worked from dawn till dusk, but they did not have enough to eat. The cheap labor profited a few French companies, even though Indochina was a financial sinkhole. The French nation spent millions of francs each year to protect and support the colony. While French companies like Michelin Rubber made millions in profits from factories and plantations. There were no major uprisings during these hard years. Vietnamese society was reeling under the impact of westernization. French culture permeated the cities, bringing western fashions and ideas. The Vietnamese elite began to give their sons a western education. Almost all of those who would lead the next resistance to the French were French educated. Among them was Ho Chi Minh. Ho Chi Minh's early years are difficult to trace. He was always mysterious about himself, giving few interviews, and preferring in later life to present himself as the benevolent Uncle Ho. Ho was born about 1890 as Nguyen Tat Tan, the son of an official who resigned rather than serve under the French. As a young man, Ho left his country working as a shiphand and cook in America, Britain, and France. In 1917, Ho moved to Paris. He took the pseudonym Nguyen I Quoc, Nguyen the Patriot, and began to agitate for Vietnam's independence. He tried to plead his cause at the Versailles Conference following World War I, but was not admitted. His effort made him famous among the Vietnamese in France. In 1920, Nguyen I Quoc became a founding member of the French Communist Party, the first Vietnamese communist. The communists sent him to Moscow for training in 1923. He traveled widely, organizing expatriate Vietnamese into a revolutionary party. Reports during the next 17 years placed him in Germany, China, Thailand, France, Russia. France was proud of its colonial record. Dans de nombreuses régions, autrefois désertiques, où des tribus hostiles les unes aux autres traînaient une existence misérable, les civilisateurs français ont apporté la paix, 
le travail, la prospérité, la joie. Par son importance et sa fécondité, le domaine français d'outre-mer est devenu un élément essentiel de la vie économique mondiale, une force active de la civilisation, un glorieux témoignage de la grandeur de la France. Japan, pursuing its conquest of China, wanted to block the transport of war material through Vietnam. In June 1940, three days after France fell to Nazi Germany, Japan demanded the right to land forces in Indochina. Japan's arrival deeply impressed the Vietnamese. Asians, like themselves, had overthrown the European colonials for it was clear who was in charge. The Japanese supported several Vietnamese nationalist groups, but other groups were both anti-French and anti-Japanese. The most important was the Viet Minh, founded in 1941 by Nguyen Ai Quoc. He had returned to Vietnam after 30 years with a new name, Ho Chi Minh, meaning he who enlightens. After the conference to establish the Viet Minh, Uncle Ho sent out a letter calling for the support of the population. And it was this that rallied the entire country around the movement. And when people realized that Ho Chi Minh was actually Nguyen Ai Quoc, their trust in the movement was further established. This was because the name Nguyen Ai Quoc had been widely known in the country. People knew that he was a great patriot. The Viet Minh organized guerrilla bases, trained cadres, harassed the French and Japanese and spread propaganda, urging the peasants to resist. Why did the Viet Minh fight the Japanese while other Asian nationalists collaborated? <laughs> I apologize, but this is a very funny question. At that time, the Japanese had already overthrown the French and begun to dominate our country. So of course we had to fight the Japanese. By early 1945, Vietnam was suffering a terrible famine. People blamed the French and Japanese, who were hoarding rice, feeding it to Japanese troops, and even exporting it to Japan, while an estimated two million Vietnamese out of eight million in the northern areas died. At that time, in our estimate, at least 40,000 starving, poor peasants arrived in Hanoi to beg for food and to wait for handouts, for alms. The French did not organize any hunger relief, and the Japanese specifically forbade us to carry out any hunger relief effort of our own. People dug into the garbage dumps in order to find any edible thing at all. They also ate rats. But this was not enough to keep them alive. The Viet Minh organized the peasants to seize rice stocks and gain tremendous prestige. This peasant support gave them a political edge they never lost. It's a long, tough road to Tokyo. It's longer to go to Tokyo than it is to Berlin, in every sense of the word. The defeat of Germany will not mean the end of the war against Japan. As the war in Europe drew to a close, Allied attention turned to Asia and the war against Japan. One of the pressing needs was intelligence. essential as the defeat of Germany. The Viet Minh believed Allied statements supporting the rights of oppressed peoples. They had given the Allies information about Japanese troop movements. 
So the Americans turned to the Viet Minh and its leader, Ho Chi Minh. I first met Ho on the China border between China and Indochina in the last days of April of 1945. He was quite an interesting individual, very sensitive, very uh, gentle, of rather frail type. We spoke quite at length about the general situation, not only in Indochina, but the world at large. We knew he was a communist, but we also uh, felt, as they did, and the way anybody who has known, ho met Ho Chi Minh, have, or I've ever talked with, had the same feeling, he was first a nationalist and second a communist. That is, he was interested in getting the independence of his people, and uh, then he thought probably the best thing for them was the communist uh, type of government. But he was a nationalist first and foremost. The Viet Minh agreed to help the Allies. Major Patty sent a training group, the Deer Mission, into the northern mountains. The Deer team went in and they uh, organized uh, out of about 500 Vietnamese. We selected, with the help of General Jap, selected 200. We spent the next four weeks training uh, these young men into the art of uh, using automatic weapons, demolition equipment, and the infiltrating and exfiltrating into various dangerous areas. There, for the first time, uh, we saw what kind of troops the Viet Minh were. They were a very willing, fine, young nationalist, really what we used to say gung-ho type. Uh, they were willing to risk their lives for their cause, the cause of independence against the French. Before Ho's men could prove their willingness, World War II was over. The sudden Japanese collapse took many in French Indochina by surprise, but the Viet Minh were ready for what they called the August Revolution. Declaring Vietnam independent, they marched in to take Hanoi peacefully. Ho Chi Minh formed a government in Hanoi, carefully mixing in members of other nationalist groups. But in the south, away from Ho's moderating influence, his followers started purging rival nationalists. Still with the Viet Minh, and perhaps reinforcing the idea of American support, was the OSS. Two or three days after I met Ho, he asked me to come in and stop in and see him, at which time he wanted to show me something. And uh, what he wanted to show me was a draft of the Declaration of Independence that he was going to declare several days later. I of course, it was in Vietnamese and I couldn't read it. And when it was interpreted to me, I was uh, quite uh, taken aback to hear the words of the American uh, Declaration of Independence. Words about liberty and life and the pursuit of happiness, etc. I just couldn't believe my own ears. On September 2nd, 1945, on board the USS Missouri in Tokyo Bay, Japan formally surrendered. And on the same day throughout Vietnam, the Vietnamese celebrated their self-proclaimed Independence Day and the formation of a new country, the Democratic Republic of Vietnam. In Hanoi, Ho Chi Minh read a speech that began, All men are created equal. They are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. Vì vậy đó, đến khi mà Hồ Chủ tịch lên lễ đài đó, I can say that the most moving moment was when President Ho Chi Minh climbed the steps and the national anthem was sung. It was the first time that the national anthem of Vietnam was sung in an official ceremony. Uncle Ho then read the Declaration of Independence, which was a short document. As he was reading, Uncle Ho stopped and asked, Compatriots, can you hear me? This simple question went into the hearts of everyone there. After a moment of silence, they all shouted, Yes, we hear you. And I can say that we did not just shout with our mouths, but with all our hearts. The hearts of over 400,000 people standing in the square then.
After Uncle Ho finished reading the Declaration of Independence, an airplane, a small one, circled over us. We did not know whose plane it was. We thought that it was a Vietnamese plane. But when it swooped down over us, we recognized the American flag. The crowd cheered enthusiastically. Ho appealed to President Harry Truman, but he would probably have accepted anyone's support. Truman did not respond to Ho's letters. He had been in office only four months in August 1945 and had not had time to formulate a policy on Indochina. There was quite a division in the State Department over Indochina. Both the Far Eastern office and the European office were in complete agreement that we wanted a strong France recovered in Europe the, from the trauma of uh, uh, Vichy and the defeat in the war. And the Euro but the European division felt the, to help get the French back on their feet, uh, we should go along with practically anything that the French wanted. The Allies had worked out a compromise plan to disarm the Japanese. Above the 16th parallel, the Chinese would take the surrender of Japanese troops. The British would do the same in the south. They arrived in Saigon in early September. The British commander, General Douglas Gracie, was a seasoned colonial officer with limited political experience. His orders were to disarm the Japanese and maintain law and order. He had absolutely no mandate whatever to uh, start talking about handing over um, French into China to anybody other than the French. He had his straight, strict instructions. The British rearmed the French and helped them drive the Viet Minh out of Saigon. The Viet Minh fought back, but they had few weapons to use against the French troops. In the south, the French retained control. In the north, Ho's Viet Minh had widespread support, but they also faced a problem, 150,000 nationalist Chinese troops. The Chinese came to disarm the Japanese. They stayed to loot and disrupt, and they threatened to remain indefinitely. Desperate to expel the Chinese, Ho Chi Minh negotiated with the French. In March 1946, they reached an agreement. The French colonial authorities displayed their power as Ho Chi Minh, president of the Democratic Republic of Vietnam, came to confirm the agreement permitting French troops back for a limited period. In return, France recognized the new Vietnamese state and the Chinese army left. Ho Chi Minh was gambling that the French would not try to seize power and that a long-range agreement could eventually be negotiated. A truce was concluded. There were to be future negotiations to settle the problems between us and France. Under these conditions, we allowed a certain number of French troops to take the place of the nearly 200,000 troops of Chiang Kai-shek, which were to evacuate our country as soon as possible. So we had some breathing time to consolidate our forces. The French in Hanoi greeted the arriving troops as conquering heroes. The Vietnamese stayed home. Ho Chi Minh traveled to France to continue the negotiations, but the French cabinet had collapsed. There was no one to negotiate with. Ho had to play tourist until a new coalition was formed. While he waited, the French administration in Saigon, acting on its own, declared the southern part of Vietnam separate from the north. It was a violation of the March Agreement, and Ho wondered if there was any point to further negotiations. Should I go back home, he asked. He was told the new government would straighten it out in Paris.
In 1946, Ho had been famous as a patriot for a quarter of a century, and the Vietnamese in Paris turned out to welcome this first president of an independent Vietnam. The French greeted the veteran communist formally as a chief of state. At the time in France, communists were part of the government. In public, relations were cordial, but in fact, the French and Vietnamese negotiators were far apart. The negotiations held at the historic Fontainebleau Chateau went badly. The Vietnamese insisted that southern Vietnam was part of their country. The French would not budge. When the meeting began, the chief of the French delegation, Max André, said to me, we only need an ordinary police operation for eight days to clean all of you out. <laughs> there was no need for negotiations. The solution had to come from Fontainebleau. Then the negotiations at Fontainebleau failed. From then on, relationships deteriorated. The climate deteriorated. The March Agreement was dead. With French and Viet Minh forces at close range, the fighting escalated. There were provocations on both sides. In November 1946, the French shelled Haiphong. Many French officers believed only force would stop the Viet Minh. When we visited Haiphong afterwards, all Vietnamese neighborhoods were completely wiped out. They were dead, buried under debris. It is difficult to know the exact figure. But the larger part of the city, it seemed to us, from what we saw, almost the entire Vietnamese part of the city had been destroyed. General Phong tried to reason with General Jap. Listen, I said, I know war. Murders, deaths, destruction, bridges blown up, burning houses. This is unthinkable. We have to prevent this. He said to me, you listen. Politics come before economics. The destruction is not important. The deaths, one million Vietnamese deaths, not important. The French will die too. We are ready. It will last two years, five years if necessary. We will no longer give in. By late 1946, Ho Chi Minh's government was forced out of Hanoi, out of the cities. The first Vietnam War had started. The French were confident that they could wipe out Chap's ragtag army quickly. They were a modern army with modern weapons, most bought with U.S. aid. The Viet Minh had widespread support from the peasants. I heard about Uncle Ho, who fought for the rights of the peasants and the workers. So as a peasant who had suffered a lot, I realized that the only correct thing for me to do was to follow the same path. At first, we did not have any weapons except for bamboo spears. But in the northern part of our country, they were producing arms. I was appointed to go there to report on the situation in the south. Uncle Ho told me that he carried the south in the depth of his heart, and I should tell him what we needed so that the central government could supply us to fight the French and drive them out of the country. 
I replied that we needed guns. Uncle Ho said that the central government could only give us so many guns because they did not have many. The main thing, he said, was to capture the enemy's guns and use these guns against them. The French bogged down in a quicksand war. Again and again, they declared an area pacified, only to find it slipping back into Viet Minh control. The guerrillas seemed to be everywhere and nowhere. In an attempt to take popular support away from the Viet Minh, the French created a rival Vietnamese government, the state of Vietnam. As its ruler, the French picked Vietnam's former emperor, Bao Dai. But they placed so many limitations on his regime that to many Vietnamese, it did not seem at all independent. 1950 brought a new source of help to the Viet Minh. Mao Tse Tung's forces arrived at Vietnam's borders, having taken all of China. They extended diplomatic recognition to Ho's government, the first country to do so. The Soviet Union followed quickly. And a week later, the United States recognized Bao Dai's rival state. Lines were being drawn in a continuing Cold War. In the early 50s, the United States had a concept of communism, international communism, as a hard monolithic block of China and Russia with no crevices in it, that was seeking to expand and gain a dominant position in the world. In Europe, they had taken over Eastern Europe, pushed into Czechoslovakia, and in Southeast Asia, an area in which we had interest, they seemed to be trying to do the same thing. The cause of freedom is being challenged throughout the world today by the forces of imperialistic communism. In May 1950, for the first time, President Truman authorized direct US aid for the French war in Indochina. Ten million dollars, the beginning of an American commitment. They have proved time after time that their talk about peace is only a cloak for imperialism. The U.S. commitment deepened after North Korean troops invaded South Korea at the end of June 1950. It was decided on the very weekend of the uh, North Korean attack that we would step up our aid very significantly to the French into Southeast Asia, because we did not know at that point whether or not the Chinese might attempt to move into that area as a part of a general offensive in Asia. By the end of 1950, the United States had given $150 million in aid to the French forces, including planes, tanks, fuel, ammunition, and napalm. As U.S. strategists looked at Asia, they saw a spreading communist menace. The fight in Korea had become an international war. And in Vietnam, the Viet Minh had linked up with communist China. Viet Minh war capacities improved dramatically. We used the new weapons to mount offensives against the French. We were able to wipe out two large French units and capture all their weapons. The way was cleared for communications between Vietnam and the outside world. Then we received military aid from China, especially equipment. The defeats on the northern border were a disaster for the French. The Indochina War was no longer just a colonial conflict. It was still small, but it had become international, supported on both sides by major powers. By the end of 1953, America was paying 80% of the war, over a billion dollars a year. Le Jeunissement, France's Vietnamizing of the war, 
and other strategies to gain Vietnamese support had failed. The French controlled the cities, but the Viet Minh controlled the countryside. The French controlled the day, the Viet Minh the night. General Henri de Navarre came in as the fifth French commander in five years. When General Navarre arrived, he opened a file right away, and on that file I wrote, War Gold. We looked for what to tell the troops. Well, until the end, this file remained practically empty. We never could express concretely our war goals. General Navarre tried yet another new strategy. French units were set up in remote areas supplied by air. Their mission was to search out and destroy the Viet Minh. The French planned to test their new strategy in a valley set among the western mountains, 170 miles from Hanoi, Dien Bien Phu. The Viet Minh had passed through the valley during a major attack on Laos. The French expected another attack and thought Dien Bien Phu would be the place to engage them. In November 1953, 12,000 French troops began dropping into the valley under the command of Colonel Christian de Castro. The top French command in Saigon was sure that Jap would never be able to mass enough troops around Dien Bien Phu, never get heavy artillery up the hills, never keep supply lines open. The command at Dien Bien Phu was equally confident. The artillery officer insisted that no Viet Minh gun would be able to fire more than three rounds. I saw all sorts of civilian and military authorities go through Dien Bien Phu. Unless my memory is completely twisted, I don't remember a single one. Absolutely not a single one of these authorities who didn't find that Dien Bien Phu was a formidable base. It was the great land and air base. It was untakeable. The Viet Minh saw Dien Bien Phu as a great opportunity, but a great gamble too. Ho Chi Minh's forces had lost heavily in attacks on other French strongpoints but they decided to take the risk. From Thái Nguyen, it took us about 45 days. We marched at night and rested during the day. Sometimes, we just slept on the roadsides if there were no shelters around. The French command was inviting a battle because they thought the Viet Minh would never be able to get enough troops and guns to Dien Bien Phu. But they did. 51,000 Viet Minh soldiers, four times the number of French troops, crossed the mountains carrying supplies on their backs and bicycles and hauling guns. Both sides had a special reason for wanting to win at Dien Bien Phu. At this same time, January 1954, the great powers were meeting in Berlin. They set a date and place, April 26th in Geneva, to meet and discuss Asian issues, including the Indochina crisis. On March 13th, Jap launched his attack on Dien Bien Phu. The battle began with massive human wave assaults. The Viet Minh guns blanketed French artillery from positions so well dug in and camouflaged that the French planes could not get at them. The first post fell within eight hours. 
By the next day, March 14th, the Viet Minh shelling had destroyed the main airstrip. The French command staff was shocked. Colonel de Castre became withdrawn, uncommunicative. On the second night, the artillery commander committed suicide, saying, I am completely dishonored. Four days into the battle, the Viet Minh controlled the entire perimeter. The cost was high, thousands dead and wounded among the Viet Minh. Jop decided to change strategy. This decision on the Dien Bien Phu front constitutes for me one of the biggest and the most difficult decisions in my fighting life. As commander, General Vo Nguyen Jop decided to end this attack based on the human wave tactic. The entire plan was changed. The attack was stopped and all the heavy artillery pieces were pulled back to a distance. Then trenches and tunnels were dug and the morale of the troops was rebuilt based on the slogan, advance solidly fight solidly. Shovels became extremely important weapons. All the cadres and soldiers put most of their time and energy into digging trenches and tunnels. We slowly surrounded Dien Bien Phu with trenches, cutting into the airstrip so it could not be used again, slowly tightening the noose around the necks of the French. With the airstrip out, the French garrison was dependent on parachute drops, but Viet Minh anti-aircraft fire forced pilots to fly too high. Supplies began falling into enemy hands. General Jacques' change in strategy was working, and he settled in for a long siege. For the French, Dien Bien Phu became a nightmare. The rainy season started early with drenching downpours. French dugouts and shelters collapsed. Clean water became impossible to find. Medical supplies ran out. No planes could land to evacuate the wounded. Men who were wounded in the trenches sunk under the yard-high mud to die. I arrived during the night of May 2nd, and Dien Bien Phu fell on May 7th. The memory I keep of it is one block of time. There was no day or night. I never lay down, I never slept. I don't remember eating. At four in the morning, there was a lull. We were 35 left at my post with one machine gun, one grenade left. So I asked on the radio, I said, since you cannot send reinforcements, he said, where do you want me to get them? You know there is nothing left. Then give me authorization to get out. He answered very simply, saying, no way. You're paratroopers. You're there to die. We built a barricade with corpses at the entrance, since we had no sandbags, and we waited. And we saw the shadows coming one by one, the Viet Minh. I decided to throw my grenade, and we immediately got return fire. One of my last impressions was to feel the wall of corpses shivering under the burst of fire. Then a grenade must have hit my helmet, because the net was burned, and the helmet dented. American helmets are very solid. I lost consciousness, and when I came to, there was above me, very close, a surgeon's mask from which a voice came, you are a prisoner of the army of the Democratic Republic of Vietnam. 
Though Viet Minh combat cameramen were present at Dien Bien Phu, scenes of the 55-day battle were restaged by a Soviet director after the French defeat. Some of the film sequences are authentic, some reenacted. Dien Bien Phu cost the French 1,500 dead, 4,000 wounded, 10,000 taken prisoner. Many of the prisoners died in Viet Minh camps. The Viet Minh victory at Tien Bien Phu cost them even more, 8,000 dead, 15,000 wounded. You are all aware that the French and their Vietnam ally have suffered reverses, notably the fall of Dinh Bien Phu after a superb defense. The present situation is grave, but by no means hopeless. In the present conference at Geneva, we and other free nations are seeking a formula by which the fighting can be ended and the people of Indochina assured true independence. So far, the communist attitude at Geneva is not encouraging. The Geneva conference bogged down almost immediately. The United States delegation was ordered to watch and not to talk. Uh, my instructions were to uh, go to the meetings, uh, to not participate in them, and uh, not to agree to anything, but to uh, be there and sit at the table. And uh, I found it uh, a very uh, difficult job to sit at the table at which people were making discussions and uh, some, of them, some conclusions were being arrived at uh, without uh, agreeing to them in situations in which uh, silence uh, itself tends to give assent. Uh, I can tell you that I was uh, very, very unhappy and perspired uh, very, very freely. Emperor Bao Dai, head of the state of Vietnam, also sent a delegation to Geneva. I was told I should accept the communists at the conference table. I said, no, there is only one Vietnamese state. It is I. The communists are rebels. Given my uncompromising position, they turned the political conference into a military conference. In June, the French cabinet fell, and a new prime minister took over, a critic of the war, Pierre Mondas France. Mandus France made a promise to the French National Assembly. If he could not resolve the Indochina question at Geneva within 30 days, he would resign. The United States feared this meant France might abandon Indochina to the communists. Washington was not at all clear as to what kind of an agreement uh, Mandus France was proposing to make or what agreement he would make. And uh, if the agreement uh, was, was going to be something with which we could possibly live or acquiesce, or whether or not we were going to have to denounce it and in effect walk out of the conference. After much secret maneuvering, one week before his deadline, Mondes France got all the participants in place in Geneva. On July 20th, the day before the deadline, two issues were still unresolved. At the conference, there were two issues under discussion. One was the temporary demarcation line between the two regions. And the other was the date of the general elections for the reunification of Vietnam. These two issues were closely connected. That was very clear. The Viet Minh, flush with their victory at Dien Bien Phu, took a hard line on both issues. But on the last day, the Soviets and the Chinese forced them to compromise. The Viet Minh, who controlled most of the country, would get less than half. The elections to reunify Vietnam would take place not soon, when the Viet Minh would surely win, but in two years. They had been undercut by their own allies. The Soviets and Chinese had several motives, among them fear. If Mendes France failed, France might keep fighting, and America might intervene. La raison et la paix 
Reason and peace have won out. After days and nights of hard negotiations, filled with anxiety and hope, the ceasefire has been signed. In my soul and my conscience, I am sure these are the best conditions we could have hoped for in the present state of things. My own feeling at the end of the conference was that uh, we had probably obtained just about all could, that could be obtained in the light of the situation on the ground. I don't, I don't think we could have obtained, have obtained much more. But I must say that very honestly, I didn't have not, not have much optimism uh, that uh, South Vietnam was going to be able to uh, survive. We thought that having signed the agreements, the French would now be forced by world opinion to carry out the Geneva Accords. And we strongly believed that there would be a general election held in two years, and then the revolution would certainly win. So we greeted each other in two years. We expected to have a general election and reunification in two years. In the fall of 1954, the Viet Minh marched into Hanoi, taking back from the French what they had lost eight years before. To America and the world, it looked like the Viet Minh would soon be marching into Saigon, too, as the French pulled out, taking everything, houses, trucks, factories, even their dead. American experience is made possible by the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation to enhance public understanding of the role of technology. The foundation also seeks to portray the lives of the men and women engaged in scientific and technological pursuit. At the Scotts Company, we help make gardens more beautiful, lawns greener, trees taller. If there's a better business to be in, please let us know. At Liberty Mutual Insurance, we do everything we can to help prevent accidents and make America a safer place. Liberty Mutual is proud to support American Experience. American Experience is also made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. Major funding for this program was provided by the National Endowment for the Humanities. We are PBS.
American Experience is made possible by the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation to enhance public understanding of the role of technology. The foundation also seeks to portray the lives of the men and women engaged in scientific and technological pursuit. At Liberty Mutual Insurance, we do everything we can to help prevent accidents and make America a safer place. Liberty Mutual is proud to support American Experience. At the Scotts Company, we help make gardens more beautiful, lawns greener, trees taller. If there's a better business to be in, please let us know. American Experience is also made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. America made a commitment to South Vietnam and to its president, Ngo Dinh Diem, in the 1950s under President Eisenhower. Mr. President, it is a great joy for me to be again in Washington and a great honor to be welcomed by you. I thank you very much. By late 1963, Ziem was dead, the U.S. government implicated in his downfall. This is the story of the beginning of America's war in Vietnam. America had given France more than two billion dollars to stop the communist-led Viet Minh in Indochina. But in 1954, after eight years of war and a hundred years of colonial rule, the French were defeated. The Geneva ceasefire agreement imposed a temporary division of Vietnam. The French could retain their influence in the south. A communist regime, headed by Ho Chi Minh, took over the north. To many Vietnamese, the Viet Minh were nationalist heroes, finally victorious in the long war against the French, finally in control of their capital city, Hanoi. To America's leaders, Ho Chi Minh represented international communism directed by Moscow. And after China's fall to the communists only five years before, they saw Ho's victory as another threat to the West. I saw everywhere that there were people who were frightened and worried at the evidence, either when they're in their own country or in very close proximity to it, of aggressive Chinese communist intentions. It would seem as though it was quite possible that the Chinese communists are not content to stop until it is apparent that they are stopped by superior resistance. In the South, American hopes for building an anti-communist state centered on Ngo Dinh Diem, a little-known nationalist appointed prime minister during the Geneva Conference. Diem had disliked French rule. Now he was inheriting their shaky bureaucracy, a demoralized army, and a capital, Saigon, seething with fierce political rivalries. He also faced a two-year deadline. The Geneva Agreements called for countrywide elections in 1956. If Ho Chi Minh won, the Communists would control all of Vietnam. The Eisenhower administration was uncertain about Diem. Could he rally the southern population and stop the spread of communism? C'était en fin août 1954. It was the end of August 1954, a month and a half after my brother Diem had come to power. I arrived in Saigon to find that my brother couldn't count on his government workers. 
ni sur l'administration civile, puisque tout le monde Because everybody was panicky. était tellement catastrophé, pas, tellement convaincu que Completely la fin était that the la end was upon them. la conquête des communistes serait the advance, terminée, the communist victory would que be at any les moment. fonctionnaires n'avaient absolument plus aucune the government people had no intention of working. de travailler. Everybody was trying to figure out how they were going to get out of this hornet's nest. Ziem had been appointed by Bao Dai, the playboy emperor picked by the French. He had few allies in South Vietnam. An austere Catholic, he had gone to America in the early 1950s and secluded himself in a New Jersey seminary. Father John Keegan. He was a mysterious kind of person because we didn't know quite exactly what he was all about. He didn't seem to us to be very important. He did dishes with us, uh, and people of importance didn't do that. Students did that, or brothers did that, and he was ZM, you know, doing dishes at the tables with uh, the rest of the students. We were impressed with his devoutness. As seminarians, we were up at 5.30 in the morning, and, and ZM would already be in a pew, meditating, uh, reflecting. He would attend mass every morning, uh, you know, quite devoutly, as far as we could see, and stay afterwards and pray. Uh, was almost as though he were living the life of a monk. By the fall of 1954, refugees from the north, most of them Catholics, were fleeing towards the south. Many had worked with the French and they feared communist reprisals. Many expected that Ziem, a Catholic, would favor them. About 900,000 Catholics under their village, Catholic priests moved from north to south. There was only a handful of people that moved from south to north to get away from the ZM government. These refugees were settled by parishes in areas that were prepared for them by the South Vietnamese government. But they remained as Catholic enclaves and very much as the Southerners, following our Civil War, objected to the carpetbaggers that came from the North and took over a good many of the political posts in the South. So also, the South Vietnamese strongly objected to the ZM adherents who came South. The refugees added to the confusion in the South, but Washington saw their value as a solid anti-communist base for ZM and as touching symbols of the Cold War. American agents assigned to the North used propaganda to spur the migration. Their chief, a veteran CIA specialist, was Colonel Edward Lansdale. Some people were very reluctant about leaving home so that the efforts on the propaganda were informative and also uh, uh, so, sort of urging them or, or nudging them real hard to come to a decision quickly because uh, there would be a period when uh, free movement wouldn't be permitted. So the orders to these people started turning into uh, sharper and sharper uh, form to get them to move and to, uh, to overcome their uh, reluctance in a, at a time of great demoralization of the people. To signal the growing American commitment to Ziem, President Eisenhower dispatched a new special envoy, his World War II colleague, General J. Lawton Collins. Collins, instructed to help train an army for Ziem, recommended $100 million in aid for the new government. Well, when I arrived in Saigon, it was chaotic. There's no question about that. The very day that I arrived, the chief of staff of the Vietnamese army, Hien, was inveighing against Ziem over a radio that was supported, as a matter of fact, by U.S. aid. All through the night, command cars, machine gun carriers, and army armored cars drove around and around the government palace. Well, I put a stop to that right off the bat, I can assure you. He said that uh, he was going to stay on, and he hinted that he would start a rebellion. I assured him that if he did that, then all military aid 
to Vietnam would cease. And so finally, by putting pressure on Hien, I got him to leave town in, oh, in about a week. And he, as a matter of fact, he never returned again. More challengers emerged from the chaos of South Vietnamese politics. Two of them headed armed religious factions. Another, backed by the French, was a former river pirate, now a notorious gangster and opium dealer. Bai Vien was his name. He controlled the, the secret police, mind you, of Vietnam. He also controlled all the houses of prostitution and the gambling joints and this was the source of his strength. Bai Vien tried to make a deal with Ziem, but Ziem refused. In open defiance of the powerful gangster, he staged a symbolic burning of opium pipes. Then he attacked Bai Vien's headquarters, located in Saigon's central police station. Ziem's challenge seemed nearly suicidal to Collins, but Lansdale, now Ziem's closest American advisor, believed in him. Ziem was laughing at me. Uh, we were out on the front porch, and he said, you were standing about where I think the first shell is going to hit, and it's going to be coming in in about 20 minutes, and you'd better get out of here, and I'm not initiating. I'm receiving here. And sure enough, 20 months later, the, the firing broke out against him. Bai Vien's private army fought Ziem's troops through the streets of Saigon. The risks for Ziem were enormous. Unless he could consolidate his power, he would lose American support. He had already lost Collins. I liked Ziem, but I became convinced that he did not have the political knack nor the strength of character politically to manage this bizarre collection of people in, in, in uh, Vietnam. We have called uh, General Collins back here, a man in whom uh, we've had, uh, have the greatest confidence and who has been right in the thick of things out there and who has been uh, supporting, of course, Premier Jim. Now, uh, there have occurred lots of difficulties. People have left the cabinet and so on. You know what most of those difficulties are. It's a strange and it's uh, almost an inexplicable situation, at least from our viewpoint. Ziem prevailed. Blocks of Saigon lay in ruins, but he had crushed his enemies. Their surrender was a personal triumph for him, but it set a dangerous pattern. Distrustful and stubborn, Ziem would never compromise. He would confront and defy all opposition. And the government of Ziem, which seemed to be uh, almost on the ropes uh, a, a few weeks ago, I think is reestablished uh, with strength. Vietnam is now a free nation, at least the southern half of it is, and it's not got a puppet government. It's not got a government that we can give orders to and tell what we want it to do or we want it to refrain from doing. If it was that kind of a government, we wouldn't be justified in supporting it. In the early days, just after his uh, installation, when he took over, we had this group of Americans, all of whom had tremendous ideas of how to further uh, uh, the efforts of the country, of how to get this thing rolling, of how to uh, get the country started, get the government organized and formed and going. We convinced him that he was not too well known, and that Ho Chi Minh was very well known by everybody, and therefore he should uh, build up his popularity. He made a series of long trips throughout the countryside, got big uh, receptions. There was, of course, an organized clack to get them enthusiastic. And he began to believe in this, that this was a good public relation ploy, that he could succeed in being a popular president. Ho Chi Minh's followers believed the countrywide elections in 1956 would bring them to power in a reunified Vietnam. They had withdrawn their troops from the south, but the Geneva Agreements allowed their political organizers to remain there and rally support for Ho. 
I and my family were very happy and supportive of the Geneva Agreement because we believed that there would not be any reprisal against the people who regrouped to the north and those who remained behind. And we thought that in two years we would have a free and fair election in which the people could freely choose their own government. The U.S. had opposed the Geneva Agreements, but pledged to respect them. Ziem, who had condemned the Accords, now resisted the nationwide election. Dulles had to decide what to do. He sat very quietly. We all sat very quietly. I can recall distinctly the clock ticking away on his wall and his breathing heavily as he read through the paper, turning to us, uh, the few of us who were there at that meeting, and saying, <coughs> I don't believe Jem wants to hold elections. I believe we should support him in this. There's this about it. At that time, we had a dictator that was now controlling more than half the country and uh, with a great deal of his population, and he would get 100% of the vote. The Americans and Ziem carried the day. There were no countrywide elections. Vietnam remained divided, and Washington welcomed Ziem as a hero. You have exemplified in your corner of the world patriotism of the highest order. You have brought to your great task of organizing your country the greatest of courage, the greatest of statesmanship. You are indeed welcome. Without American support, Ziem would never have survived. With it, he seemed to have done the impossible. Washington held him up to the world as a model of anti-communism, the miracle man of Asia. Ziem welcomed the weapons and the dollars, but he often resisted the Americans' advice. He was polite, but he was rigid and proud and fiercely nationalistic. I think he looked upon us as great big children, well-intentioned, powerful, with a lot of technical know-how, but not very sophisticated in dealing with, uh, with him uh, or his race or his country's problems. During the late 1950s, Diem's problems grew. Like a traditional Vietnamese Mandarin, he drew his small circle closer around him relying on his family, especially his brother Nguyen Nhu and Nhu's wife. Their secret police run by Nhu set out to eliminate communists and other dissidents. After the Viet Minh army regrouped to the north and the Xiam regime took over the south, repression began. Those of us who had directly fought against the French and people who had helped organize the resistance against them were the special targets of Ziem's revenge. The manners of tortures inflicted upon these people by Ngo Dinh Ziem and his hound dogs, this was our term for the secret police, were extremely inhumane. We were not Catholics, we only worshipped our ancestors. And so they forced us to throw the altar to the ancestors away and to become Catholics and to denounce the communists. They had, uh, in some provinces, uh, eliminated most of the stay-behind political agents, the ones that exposed themselves and proselytized the people and began to complain uh, against the government. But in doing this, with this heavy-handed police apparatus that he had set up, they also harmed and incarcerated and eliminated a lot of people who were not uh, uh, involved with the communist movement. As the Americans and Ziem became more and more repressive, people started telling us we'd have to fight. They said we'd be wiped out if we kept to our plan of just political struggle. This film marked a new phase of the struggle in the South, the formation in 1960 of the National Liberation Front, a communist-organized coalition of anti-ZM forces. 
Denied the election promised at Geneva and nearly destroyed by Diem and News Police, the communist leadership and its southern supporters decided to go back to war. It would be, they said, a war of national liberation against Diem and against the American presence in Vietnam. You will not be able to strangle the voice of the people, which roars out and will go on sounding. Down with colonialism. The sooner we bury it, and the deeper, the better. At the UN, Soviet Premier Nikita Khrushchev encouraged wars of national liberation. The new president took over in an atmosphere of grave threats and confrontation between East and West. John Kennedy was in office only a few months when he suffered a humiliating defeat at the Bay of Pigs in Cuba. Communist leader Fidel Castro crushed a secret American plan to oust him and then paraded his prisoners for the world to see. The invasion planning had begun before Kennedy took office, and Eisenhower joined him during the crisis. Soon, a badly shaken Kennedy faced questions on another war of national liberation in Vietnam. The problem of troops uh, is a matter uh, that, uh, and the matter of what we're going to do uh, to assist uh, Vietnam to retain its independence is a matter still under consideration. There are a good many which I think can most usefully wait. We've had consultation with the government, which uh, up to the present time, uh, which will be one of the matters which uh, uh, Vice President Johnson will deal with, the problem of consultations with the government of Vietnam as to what further steps could most usefully be taken. Kennedy sent his vice president, Lyndon Johnson, to Saigon to reassure Diem. The U.S. seemed to be faltering, and Diem was worried. Johnson performed like a Texas politician on the campaign trail. Tell him that in the battle uh, for Britain, when the clouds were over uh, the little island uh, of uh, uh, England, Churchill said, we'll fight him in the alleys, in the streets, uh, on his tour around Saigon, Vice President Johnson has stopped his motorcade. He talks to just about anybody around. Now he's taking a ride in what's known as a pedicab. Johnson really enjoys this kind of thing. Nothing phases him. He tries everything. President Kennedy was determined on this one because of a number of early setbacks, the Bay of Pigs to begin, the dressing down, in effect, that he got from Khrushchev in the Vienna conference when, he first, when they first met each other, uh, and finally the Berlin Wall. So Vietnam was the point. Kennedy and his men saw themselves in a struggle with Khrushchev for the loyalty of new nations. To them, national liberation was code for communist aggression. South Vietnam is already under attack. Sometimes by a single assassin. Sometimes by a band of guerrillas. Recently by full battalions. The peaceful borders of Burma, Cambodia, and India have been repeatedly violated. And the peaceful people of Laos are in danger of losing they gained not so long ago. No one can promise these wars of liberation. For these are free countries living under their own governments. Nor are these aggressions any less real because men are knifed in their homes and not shot in the field of battle. In October 1961, two key Kennedy advisors, General Maxwell Taylor and Walt Rostow, arrived in Vietnam. Their visit coincided with a serious flood. They recommended a big increase in military aid, including U.S. combat troops disguised as flood fighters. Diem said no to the troops. He needed U.S. support, but he wanted to keep control, and he wanted to keep the foreigners out. 
he feared an overwhelming American influence. That was one of the reasons he didn't want American combat forces. Uh, he was, to my mind, prescient in, in, in this. Um, said, in effect, he thought it would be a bonanza for the Viet Cong. Kennedy, too, was reluctant to send ground troops, but he wanted to be tough. The answer for little wars, guerrilla wars like South Vietnam's, was counterinsurgency. Special forces like the Green Berets were sent to train the troops of threatened countries. They went in small numbers, but they brought with them the best of American military technology. Counterinsurgency was stylish and exciting, and it suited JFK's needs perfectly. One of its strongest proponents was Kennedy aide Roger Hillsman. My idea was that the role of the special forces were to train Vietnamese to behave as guerrillas, harassing the supply lines down through the mountains of the, uh, the Viet Cong. And the special, American special forces were to train their special forces to do that. The communist-led movement in the South, now termed the Viet Cong, had made big gains in 1961. With increased U.S. aid and the new counterinsurgency program, Kennedy raised America's ante. He could win this limited war with a few American advisors, a lot of American hardware, and a positive attitude. So I feel that uh, being humble and putting yourself in their position uh, is a way to do it. Uh, I have gone out and uh, helped them pick watermelons. I walk around uh, with my bodyguard, uh, he and I, and we go visit them and drink tea with them in the houses, uh, in their house. And this, this is an oddity to them because they, they can't imagine that an American can put himself in this position. Uh, so therefore, it's going to be the man who can give them the most, uh, show them that they can support them better, that will win their confidence and win their support. And as you know, it's the man who gets the support of this farmer who is going to eventually win this war. Absolute loyalty to the fatherland and the president of the Republic of Vietnam. We swear to sacrifice ourselves to defend our country and the personalist Republic regime. The ceremonies hid widening cracks inside the regime. In early 1962, two of Ziem's own Air Force officers bombed the palace, hoping to topple the tightly knit ruling family. Madame Nhu was injured. Just next to me was a bomb that had fallen. It was fat like this, just like a little pig. It hadn't exploded, it was just there. And I was just there, too. <laughs> Are you afraid of death? Me? Oh, no, not at all. Because in my country, death is always just around the corner. If you're afraid of it, you can't do anything. The Viet Cong had assassinated 500 civilians and Ziem officials and killed 1,500 of his troops in the first half of 1961. VC influence in the countryside was growing. Ziem's brother, Nhu, encouraged by U.S. advisors, promoted a program to isolate peasants from the guerrillas. He ordered the construction of thousands of fortified villages, strategic hamlets. We are building strategic hamlets to bring peace throughout the country. This was their motto and their code of faith. Volunteers from every class and age, men and women and children, began the hard physical work of construction. First, they broke arable land to make the deep moats and the high fences. First came the moat around the entire village. The bamboo spikes, making an ancient but thoroughly efficient protection against invaders, have become the trademark of the strategic hamlets 
and each spike is cut and set by willing hands. In reality, life inside the spiky perimeter didn't measure up to the ideal. Ziem's half-hearted land reform in the 50s had failed, and now the already resentful farmers were forced to relocate to the hamlets, which were targets for Viet Cong attacks. Defense Secretary McNamara toured some hamlets with Ambassador Nolting in May 1962. Though American officials had private reservations about the program, McNamara publicly praised it. The Americans were trying to be optimistic. Major, how would you say the war was going in your sector? Well, I think here lately, the that's going a lot better. I think we're beginning to, to win the people over. Our operations are, are going better. We're, we're actually getting VC. Uh, what evidence do you have that the, you're winning the people over? Well, we've got this strategic hamlet program uh, going on. When we go out on these operations, uh, it seems like the people are more friendly. Several times recently we've had people uh, warn the Vietnamese troops that there was an ambush ahead or something like that. This means the people are getting on our side. It was just a year ago that you ought to stepped up aid to Vietnam. There seems to be a good deal of discouragement about the progress. Can you give us your assessment? No, we are putting in a major effort in Vietnam. As you know, we have, uh, have about 10 or 11 times as many men there as we had a year ago. They are... Uh, we've had a number of casualties. We put in an awful lot of equipment. We're going ahead with the strategic hamlet proposal. Some phases, the military program has been uh, quite successful. There is great difficulty, however, in fighting a guerrilla war. You need 10 to 1 or 11 to 1, especially in terrain as difficult as South Vietnam. But I'm... Uh, so we're not... Uh, we don't see the end of the tunnel, but uh, I must say I don't think it's uh, darker than it was a year ago, in some ways lighter. But there was rising opposition to Diem's government especially to his brother New, who controlled the secret police and an elaborate intelligence network. Brilliant and eccentric, New was at war not only with the communists, but with all critics of the regime. My husband, he was very unhappy. With, um, on one side, his brother, the other side, uh, his wife, he considered um, both of us as babes, babes in the woods. But he said to his brother, you, you should be a monk, and you, uh, to me, just, just keep quiet. Don't say anything. Vietnam had been a concern to the Kennedy administration, but it was not a major concern. Suddenly, in the spring of 1963, it became a crisis. Buddhist groups protesting that Ziem's soldiers had killed eight worshippers while breaking up a gathering in Hue began a series of demonstrations. At first, Ziem and his family did not take the Buddhists seriously. My brother Ziem, the president, never stopped giving aid and good advice to the Buddhists. He used to say to them, try to do something to reorganize your religion. As it is now, just about anyone can say he's a good Buddhist. All he has to do is shave his head and eyebrows and put on a robe. As the demonstrations grew, Ziem rejected compromise and met the challengers with force. A Buddhist monk, Thich Quang Duc, countered with a traditional act that horrified the West. The Reverend Quang Duc decided to dedicate his body as a torch to light the struggle to preserve religious teaching. I saw him step out of his car and assume the lotus position. Then a monk stepped forward and helped the reverend pour gasoline on himself. At that moment, a flame engulfed his body.
The photos hit the front pages in America and were on Kennedy's desk in the morning. Kwang Duk had become a martyr. Saigon students joined the Buddhists and the protests against Ziem exploded. During the Reverend Kwang Duk's cremation, everything was burned except for his heart, which remained intact. His heart was set on fire two more times, but it still did not burn. What have the Buddhist leaders done comparatively? The only thing they have done 